So thank you very much, Yarik, for the invitation and the introduction of my person. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to get in touch with the Anglo-Belarusian society. Myself, I'm exponent of the minority of the German Belarus enthusiasts, but we have especially in our center of Eastern European history in Gießen, very strong scholars. During the last 10 years, we have produced eight dissertations on Belarusian topics. You see here on the slide the cover of the first volume, which I present tomorrow at the Franciscarina Library. Ladies and gentlemen, when German and Belarusian historians met in Berlin a month ago to establish a joint commission, they took lessons from the London School for Slavonic and East European Studies. For the sake of political correctness, the name Belarusian German Historical Commission was chosen. Remarkable is not the fact that the masculine word historian was, has been avoided in the title, but the spelling of the adjective Belarusian with only one S, which is unusual in Germany. After the question of the alpha and the omega on the level of the nouns had previously been decided, in favor of Belarus and to the disadvantage of Belorussia, a second terminological revolution is in the offering for the specialists. Referring to the soft sign in the word Belarus, I will today even go a step further. Let us once again discuss the female entity of the Belaya Rus. The idea to establish an association of historians goes back to a visit of the German federal president, Franz Walter Steinmeier, to Minsk in June 2018, on the occasion of the opening of the Kristinez Memorial. Steinmeier saw this as an opportunity to allow the Republic of Belarus to emerge from the shadow of the Soviet Union, where it is apparently still in the public eye in Germany. In order to make this dimension plausible to the German audience, the language used in news broadcast in dealing this Europe's last dictatorship is now Belarus, also known as White Russia. At the meeting in Berlin one month ago, misunderstandings between the proponents of the Eurasian Economic Union and the representatives of the European Union on the semantic level could not be avoided. The preamble of the historical commission, for example, contains the following formulation. Cooperation shall be based on scientific principles and freedom of research and teaching in order to promote the deepening of historical knowledge and to counteract the distortion of history. While the German side is committed to the independence of teaching and research in the sense of Wilhelm von Humboldt, the Belarusian side does not want to allow deviations from the principle of historicism in the sense of Karl Popper. It advocates a policy of history which, in the spirit of President Alexander Lukashenko, elevates statehood to the leading paradigm of 1,500 years of Belarusian history. Against this background, I would like to identify myself as a student of the 
Belarusian writer and Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich and quote from her words of thanks which she gave at the award ceremony for the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade 2013. Each of us carries a piece of history within us. One may carry a big one, the other a small one. And from all of this, the master narrative emerges. So if you look at the historical process as a whole, as an outside observer, I cannot help but take a German perspective. It represents no more than an input for further discussions. With the title of my lecture, Backpipe Players and Painted Birds, I choose today an approach to the history of Belarus which plays with imaginations and is therefore fictional. I work with metaphors to make the phenomenon of Belarus understandable. As a professional historian, I see my task in the problematization of historical conditions and the formulating of historical questions. What I'm able to do is just to comment current research paradigms and historical images. Under this premise, I would like to begin my considerations with the following theses. First, the history of Belarus in the true sense of the word concerns the everyday life of the Polish landed gentry, Jewish merchants, Russian officials and Belarusian peasants. Second, the history of Belarus ranges from the publication of the Bible by Francis Galrina and the constitution of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the first quarter of the 16th century to the forced collectivization of agriculture and the Holocaust in the middle of the 20th century, if you like, from 1517 to 1944. Perhaps the key to explaining the enigma of present Belarus lies in the socio-economic and cultural turmoil of the mid-20th century. Anyone who wants to understand the Belarusian past must, beyond the catastrophes of the Holocaust and Chernobyl, or the caesuras of industrialization and urbanization, consult historical geography and environmental history in order to fathom the pre-modern living conditions of whole generations of people in a landscape that consisted largely of swamps and forests. What I want to illustrate on the basis of my theses are the metamorphoses that took place in the transition region of Central and Eastern Europe in the process of Soviet modernization. It is about the interspaces between Germany and Russia in a broader sense or about the contact zone between poets and Belarusians in a narrower sense. Depending on this contextualization, this historical region has experienced different attributions. In early modern times, this region represented the Sarmatian landscapes. In modern times, the Jewish settlement area and in contemporary history, the bloodlands. Are you going to get the, the Samaritan landscapes is an imagination by the poet Johannes Bobrowski. It is based on the ideology of the nobility in the Polish Lithuanian Union, who referred to the ancient equestrian people of the Samaritans to pay homage to federalism and the idea of freedom. Timothy Snyder called the territories of the former settlement area 
for the Jewish population for the Tsarist Empire, which mutated into the battlefield of the dictators Hitler and Stalin during the Second World War bloodlands. Stalinist terror and forced collectivization, as well as nationalist occupation and the Holocaust, prefigured starvation, deportation, and genocide. Places of remembrance could not be more contradictory than Sarmatian landscapes and bloodlands. They are constituted by the overlapping of romantic nostalgia and traumatic experiences. The disappearance of the walls of the Polish Schlachta, Russian officials, Jewish merchants and Belarusian peasants without neglecting the multicultural component of Lithuanians and Ukrainians and of Tatars and Roma occurred not only due to the Gulag and the Holocaust, but is also linked to industrialization and urbanization as well as Russification and Sovietization. What I would like to comment in the following is the transformation of natives from the countryside into inhabitants of socialist cities, or rather the mutation from locals to Homo Sovieticus. As I already said, my approach today is fictional. I'm working with metaphors to get in touch with the Belarusian phenomenon. Inspired by a title of a novel by Ivan Melish from 1965, in my imagination, Belarusians are people of the marsh. To describe the scene of action, Melish introduced a village from Polesia as an island surrounded by marshes and isolated from the world. The inhabitants share a traditional way of life that depend on the seasonal changes wrought by the thaw, a way of life that the writer feels to be archaic, perhaps even prehistoric. Swarms of mosquitoes and crowds of snakes even prevent any sunshine from being enjoyed. Only the construction of a lock dam offers a way out of the misery and a perspective for the future. In this reading, the landscape is represented as a polymorphic archipelago. In this view, perhaps, the past of Belarus in the end amounts to little more than be a sum of local histories. I'd like to open two windows into the past, whose horizons shall be marked by key text. The first window belongs to developments before World War I and is connected with a short story of Jakob Kollas. The second window attends events of World War II and is related to a novel of Jerzy Kaczynski. In both cases, commentary supplements to the main text offer views into Soviet history on the one side in the era of revolutionary culture of the 1920s and on the other side in the political saw of the 1950s. Time window one the bagpipe player or Sarmatian landscapes. Jakub Koller's short story, The Bagpipe Player, Dudar, is readable as an allegory of Belarusian history. The author, Konstantin Mitskevich, was born 1882, the son of a forest ranger on a farm in the southwest of Minsk. His pseudonym, Kolos, means ear and indicates his affinity to the peasant world. Before World War I, the writer worked as teacher and supported 
the Belarusian journal Nasha Liva, the flagship of the Belarusian national movement. The story, the bagpipe player from 1906 was republished in 1921 in the cycle Fairy Tales of Life. Jakub Kollas was nominated as vice president of the Belarusian Academy of Sciences in 1928. After World War II, he, the highly decorated writer was honored politically as deputy of the highest Soviet of the USSR. He died in 1956 and largely missed the chance to realize the possibilities of de-Stalinization. The story, the bagpipe player, tells about the meeting of three brothers. The youngest brother has got the bitterest lot. Fate has decreed to him the least fertile land. Forest and marshes isolate him from the world. In his loneliness, he finds peace only in sad songs, especially by playing the bagpipe. With his peasant clothes and his bast shoes, he differs in his outfit completely from his brothers. While the elder brother sports suit and boots produced by the modern clothing industry, the millman dresses in a folkloristic manner with white pantaloons and a large cap. The eldest brother leads the talk. When the youngest brother gets a chance to say a few words, he is at once ridiculed because of his tongue. At long last, he justifies himself in the manner of the Bible with a parable. A Polish landlord locks a bagpipe player in a dungeon and demands that he play. In the case that the sounds penetrate through the wall, he should win the right to sing his songs for the people and to tell the world his thoughts. As expected, no sound at all could be heard outside. Therefore, the sad melody was doomed to die away in the fields in the marshes and in the forests. With this word, the youngest brother appealed to the elder ones to strive together for happiness, but to tolerate different ways of life and forms of articulation. Who are the three brothers? Why aren't other family members mentioned? The first brother personifies an intellectual, the second a Cossack, and the third a peasant. They symbolize the figures Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Considering the names of the three countries and their gender, it would be more appropriate to talk about three sisters. But a larger objection could be entered in the framework of empire, at least Poles and Jews should have been mentioned as other family members. Their existence is indicated only indirectly by mentioning a landlord or his administrator. In the project of nation building, a half-sister or a stepsister obviously doesn't play any role at all. Before the alternative, noble republic or nation state, the writer confesses himself clearly for the Eastern Slavic nuclear family and problematizes in this context exclusively the limits of variety in communication. <coughs> Who is the bagpipe player? Where does he come from? How does he make his living? Why is he wailing? Why doesn't he free himself from this desperate situation? The bagpipe player is at home behind the Ukrainian black soil area in a landscape characterized by marshes and forests along the river Pripyat. He does subsistence farming and lives in backwardness. Tsarist rule and censorship prevent him from 
participating in political decisions and practicing his mother tongue. For reconciliation with God and the world, there remains to him, beside an ascetic way of life, only the sad song of the bagpipe. The landscape received her cultural imprint during the Middle Ages and the early modern era through the great principality of Lithuania and the Polish Noble Republic. And since the end of the 18th century, through the Tsarist and Soviet Empire. Concerning genuine state traditions, the independent Republic of Belarus may find its antecedent beside the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic only in the short lived Belarusian People's Republic of 1918. Under this premise, it is worth mentioning the revised edition of the short story The Backpipe Player, which Jakub Kollers published in 1922. The Backpipe Player, in this case, presented as a people's tribune who is able to reach the masses through his personal integrity. In confrontation with the landlord, he refers to natural laws. Supported by the wind, the sound of the bagpipe crosses over the walls and makes it ways to the people. They free the bagpipe player and imprison the landlord. The elder brothers are not mentioned anymore. Due to a constitution of a Belarusian Soviet Republic, they do not play any role at all. Considering the fact that the BSSSR in the 1920s was characterized by an equality in rank of four languages, Russian, Polish, Belarusian, and Yiddish, Kolos could be criticized for omitting an important facet of the real Belarus. In his conception, the urban world is without significance because the ethnic Belarusian nearly exclusively lived in the countryside. Now, during this period, Belarus still entertains the culture of the Jewish state. Therefore, reading the bagpipe player, the image of another musician should not be overlooked, namely the fiddler on the roof by Marc Chagall, expressing an homage to his hometown, Vitebsk. Time window number two, the painted bird or bloodlands. The plot of Jerzy Kosinski's novel, The Painted Bird, published in the United States in 1965, is dictated by the fate of a boy who joined the underground in the eastern territories of Poland during World War II. At first, the American audience read the book merely as autobiographical. Krasinski was born in 1933 as Josef Livingkopf in a Jewish family in Lutsch. After the war, he studied in his hometown sociology and history. During the 20th Party Congress and the beginning of de-Stalinization, he stayed put as a PhD student of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Moscow. In 1957, he emigrated to the US, where in the first half of the 1960s, he published two sociological studies about the Soviet Union under the pseudonym Joseph Novak. Although he twice had been chosen president of the American Pen Club, he was confronted with the accusation of plagiarism. In 1991, a few months before the breakup of the Soviet Union, he committed suicide. The novel, The Painted Bird, depicts a four-year odyssey of a small boy who, after the German attack on Poland, is sent to the eastern territories 
and finds himself in a daily lonely fight for survival. Because of his olive skin, his dark hair and his black eye, the educated Polish-speaking boy leaves the impression in the villages of the province of being a Jew or Rom, an open question through the entire plot of the book. The whirlwind of violence in which the boy is swept up comes from the archaic activities of peasant people who scrap their anarchic existence under the condition of German occupation where the borders between good and evil have become blurred. Obviously, Krasinski turned out in a surrealistic manner experiences of World War II. Accordingly, the place of the fictive plot stays nebulous. But in the preface, the writer offers for an informed reader enough hints to come to a conclusion. Before our eyes appears the marshes and forests of Podlachia and Polesia, which during the wars belonged as eastern territories to the Second Polish Republic, while the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic claimed them as Western Belarus. The inhabitants of this socioeconomic backward region understood themselves far beyond ethnic or confessional identities as from here, indicated in the answers to the question of their origin in the Polish census of 1921 and 31. The Belarusian writer Janka Kupala created for the locals to Tatia in his committee of the same name in 1922, a lasting memorial, even if the place of action is transferred into the capital Minsk and the main protagonist before the background of the turbulences of civil war exposed as a political opportunist. Also, Krasinski doesn't exactly identify the locals, he blackens their reputation as hillbillies. The metaphor of the painted bird in Krasinski's novel is spun around the bird catcher Lech an unconventional loner and outsider yearning for a free and unrestrained life. Lech is blinded by his love for the stupid Ludmilla who lives in the woods and offers her sexual services to the men of the village for free. On one occasion when Ludmilla, whose Russian name connotes love to people disappears for a suspiciously long time, Lech, who has the name of the antecedent of all Poles, driven to despair, sacrifices the most valuable thing he owns, his caged birds. One by one, he releases them in a perfidious way back into the wild. Lech paints them and watches on as they got torn to pieces by their fellow birds. For the reader, the riddle finds its climax when not long later the worshipped Ludmilla is massacred by the woman of the village. The moral of the story becomes clear when the metaphor of the painted bird is attributed to the sources of Krasinski. The personal sources consist less of the traumatic experiences of Polish Jews and more to the personal experiences of the author during a research stay in the Saw era Soviet Union. With respect to this, Krasinski displayed his predispositions in a study in 1962 entitled No Third Pass. In this context, Krasinski presented under the pseudonym Joseph Novak the results of a sociological investigation 
about the relationship between the individual and collective in a professional working group. He argued that the physical terror on which Stalinist rule was based had, after 1953, been replaced by collective constraints. In this context, Krasinski reserved a prominent place for the literature aficionada Varvara, who, after deviating from the party line on cultural question, is banned from the journalistic profession. Varvara explains her own fate by recounting a childhood experience with a very same painted bird. A group of youngsters painted a sparrow red in the expectation that he would be admired by his fellow sparrows. Instead, however, the gray swarm instinctively attacked and killed him. In this episode, Varvara saw a reflection of her own fate. In the end, the painting of a being striving for freedom symbolizes a form of individualism which is considered inopportune. The innocent becomes an outsider. For the perpetrators, the killing is justified by distrust and hatred for deviations from the norm. The painted bird can thus be read as a dramatic parable of the Sovietization of living conditions. The isolation of deviance and the criminalization of nonconformism replaced the mass violence of Stalin's era. What connects the fictional story of the painted bird with the real history of Eastern Poland and Western Belarus? Obviously, due to the process of forced collectivization and Stalinist terror as well as Nazi occupation and Holocaust, the imagined community of the Polish Schlachter, the Russian officials, the Jewish merchants and the Belarusian peasants finally disappeared from the historical scene. Apart from the unification of the BSSSR with the Kresi at the beginning of World War II, the 20th century represented up to the nuclear accident of Chernobyl an era of demographic catastrophes. Furthermore, the socioeconomic transformation after the war evoked a new phase of Belarus. As a result of rapid urbanization within two decades, an agrarian country was transformed into an industrial state. Consequences of socialist modernization and cultural Sovietization had been the Russification of the native language and the abandonment of Belarusian identity. In the debate about the locals, the question whether Belarusians possess deficient national consciousness is continually raised. With the development of a peculiar mixed language of Russian and Belarusian after World War II, a language raised in the countryside but shamed in the urban world, this question configured itself anew. Before this background, the metaphor of the painted bird symbolizes the metamorphosis of the community of the self-sufficient locals into the species of the conformist homo sovieticus. I'm coming to a conclusion. If we want the Republic of Belarus to emerge from the shadow of the Soviet Union in the sense of the German president and emphasize its independence, this cannot be done if its history is conceived in the spirit of classical historicism or in the terms of national history. What distinguishes Belarus in a historical perspective is its transnational character. 
It is a region between Central and Eastern Europe that is defined by its multicultural flavor on the one hand and the catastrophic experience of wars on the other. Currently, the cultural landscape is well repre represented by world heritage sites such as Neswish and Mir, as well as national memorials such as Khatin and Trastenils. Do the ongoing efforts to find archaeological sites that would supposedly draw a continuous line of Belarusian statehood from the 6th to the 21st century really make sense? After all, from a Western point of view, the invention of tradition was something that fell into the age of nationalism around 1900. Anyone who still focuses on monuments today and pays homage to a glorious past will need a long time before he arrives scientifically and postmodernism and political meets the demands of globalization. Perhaps in the spirit of Svetlana Alexievich, it's once again time to reflect on the fate of the common people. Each of us carries a piece of history within us. One may carry a big one, the other mark a small one. And from all of this, the master narrative emerges. Alexeyevich, words are saving, serving as a motto of this lecture. Belarusian history should see itself in a special way as a sum of individual experiences. We need a whole range of local stories and individual fates to arrive at a new master narrative. If we look back to the caesuras and catastrophes of the 20th century, we have to deal with traumatic experiences. In this sense, I simply plead for a paradigm shift from political history to family history. From the end of the 19th century to World War II, the common people in the Samadian landscapes and the bloodlands defined themselves as locals. Terminological construction based on the Lithuanian news or derived from the slogan, Republic of the Partisans, belonged to the elites and were artificial. More profanely, the American journalist of Belarusian Jewish origin, Morris Hindus, in 1931, described the region of his former village in the area of Slutsk as a madlands of central Russia. Inspired by sympathy for the illiterate, illiterate peasants and by respect before the first achievements of Soviet modernity, he mentioned the site of a school, a kindergarten, and a fire brigade as an unexpected contrast to the images from his memories. In his childhood, the rhythm of the day was dictated by the milking of the cow in the barn and the barking of the dog in the courtyard. How could Hindus describe at all such an idyllic picture at the starting point of Soviet forced collectivization. The Belarusian philosopher Valentin Akudovich in his essay, Code of Absence, a few years ago, went so far to declare the changes in the landscape through the draining of the marshes and the disappearing of the villages as events of apocalyptic significance. If anyone is going to understand Belarus, he has an awareness of catastrophes like the Holocaust and Chernobyl to consult historical geography and environmental history to define the living conditions in a landscape 
made of mudlands and forests. It is worth mentioning that the myths of partisans resulting from the Soviet area in the underground scene of the Republic of Belarus is used as expression of a cultural revolution underlining the European elements of the country. Clearly, it is time for bagpipe players and painted birds to conquer the stage. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bourne, for, for your lecture. Uh, so it was a, a mixture of history and, and literature and, and cultural studies. Uh, very interesting. I was wondering whether we could actually say that Belarus before the Second World War and Belarus after the Second World War are almost two different countries. Because if you think, for example, about the ethnic composition of the country, about the linguistic part, about religious and religiosity of the population, about the even the geography itself, let's say the physical uh, appearance of the land, all those marshes which disappeared. Would you agree that, uh, to a significant extent, that's that's what can be described as like completely two different countries? Or, or can you see that there is something which uh, migrates all the time through different periods of time? It's interesting that not long ago there was a, a survey of Belarusians asking them what it means for you to be a Belarusian. And uh, for most people it's their passport. So it's not really a particular language or religion, but it's, it's their passport. So it, it says uh, they, the citizen of the Republic of Belarus, then it means that this person is Belarusian. Is there anything intrinsic to uh, to Belarus, uh, to Belarusians as a nation, uh, which you think traveled from all those times uh, to our times? The question relating to the caesuras and the continuities is a very old methodological problem for historians. Of course, there are both. In my opinion. The Second World War was a real strong caesura in Belarusian history. On the one side, the Jewish element was completely destroyed, eliminated by national socialism. On the other side, the modernization was so rapid in the 50s and 60s that I've got the impression that the society changed demographically and sociologically completely. What concerns identity, I'm a little bit skeptical because I, for myself, have different identities. I was born in the north of Germany. My ancestors are partly from France, partly from Bulgaria. I am a professional uh, fan of the Republic of Belarus in certain sense. I have a Belarusian identity and now professionally at the University of Gießen I have to be uh, become friend even with my Hessian surrounding. We had this discussion about identity in Germany in the 90s and were rather frustrated because it founded no conclusion. Therefore, from the outside, I looked always a little bit skeptical on the discussions in Belarus because I've got the impression that the main contact is rather artificial. When I began my teaching at the University of Gießen 10 years ago, I joked that Belarus is still a white paper. In the meantime, I have the opposite impression. There are so many colors that it is rather difficult to find a structure. Therefore, I was really impressed by the discussions today 
by the reference to historiography, to historical policy, we should be aware that we follow more postmodern paradigms of history as member of a historical commission I am now got in touch with the paradigm of national history which German historians don't like anymore. So this is always an open question.